Funding for this program made possible in part by a grant from the Fannie Mae Foundation, helping to rebuild Louisiana. We have this landscape that is a disaster. We've got problems across the entire state. We had over 80,000 businesses that were out of business. The events of the last year have had a dramatic effect on the roadways, about a 50% increase in traffic. The idea of this planning, the idea of the kind of let's channel that growth and put it in areas that we all agree you know, make sense. Our government should, without a doubt, protect us with better levies. That should be the main focus. The storms were tragic events, but they have brought great opportunity. In the past year, we've heard many voices. Voices of fear and hope. Voices of desperation and comfort. And voices of concern about the future of Louisiana. I hope that you'll lend your voice to that chorus. It may be one of the most important things you're ever asked to do for our state. I'm Lynn Whitfield, and I love Louisiana. Though my acting career has taken me around the globe and far from home, I am constantly drawn right back here where I grew up in Louisiana. You know, I still marvel at Louisiana's beauty, the diversity, joy of life and its heritage as thick and rich as some of its accents. But in 2005, nature dealt a heavy blow to Louisiana. The tragedy and devastation of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita were unprecedented. These deadly storms claimed nearly 1,500 lives across the state. They destroyed more than 200,000 homes, 18,000 businesses, and initially displaced more than 1.3 million Louisiana residents. Areas along the southwestern Louisiana coast were decimated by winds and water. 80% of New Orleans flooded. These two storms are the first and third most expensive natural disasters in American history and the repercussions will be felt for decades to come. The Louisiana Recovery Authority is the planning and coordinating agency created to assist with the rebuilding of Louisiana. At this critical moment in time, it is important that all citizens be involved in planning our future. Louisiana Speaks is that effort. It's the plan that will help guide the state's recovery and rebuilding and it was paid for by private foundations that think Louisiana needs more than just recovery. We need a vision and a plan to guide us into the future. And it's not just a plan developed by a few. It's being developed with significant input from people around the state just like you. According to Dr. Norman Francis, president of Xavier University and chair of the Louisiana Recovery Authority, the LRA has actively sought citizen involvement in the planning process. Any success that we're going to have in rebuilding Louisiana must have the broad participation of individuals. Uh, we need the people who live in these areas, who work in these areas, who know what works and doesn't work. And you know, many times we have to have experts and they're absolutely necessary, but they don't always know what is important in a community, and people do. Over the course of last summer, Louisiana Speaks brought together a thousand Louisianians for workshops in Lake Charles, Lafayette, Baton Rouge, Homa Thibodeau, the North Shore, and New Orleans to provide creative input. Well, I think the intent today was to bring um, community leaders and stakeholders in this area together to look at some big picture um, issues facing South Louisiana, especially in this post-Katrina and Rita environment. We got together and walked through a bunch of different exercises to get a sense of what that future should look like. And it was interesting because we were able to talk about the coast of Louisiana and how we build a, a real sustainable coast looking at you know, wetlands restoration as well as hurricane protection and putting those two elements together in ways that I don't think right now the Corps of Engineers is doing. Uh, and so people just got together to share those ideas, which was great. Prior to the workshops, Louisiana Speaks surveyed more than 2,500 randomly chosen residents, including evacuees in 27 states, to get their opinions as well. All of this input from workshops and surveys has provided the team at Louisiana Speaks with information about the concerns of Louisiana citizens. Through this program, we will be introducing these concerns to an even broader audience, you. 
to get your opinions on some of the long-term challenges we face. We are being given a chance to make changes. Changes that will affect different citizens in different ways. Changes that will affect us immediately and changes that we won't see, but will be experienced by our children and grandchildren. We're going to cover several fundamental questions that we need to answer to ensure a better future for our state. These questions include, how can we be safer from storms? How can we create better access to jobs and housing? And how do we fit it all together in a vision for a growing and vibrant Louisiana? At the end of the program, you'll have three ways that you can speak up. You can call this toll-free number at 1-888-PLAN-2050 or 1-888-752-6205. You can log on to www.louisianaspeaks.org or if you have one of the polling forms that were inserted in your January 24th newspaper, simply complete and mail it in. The issues we'll be exploring will all be pieces of a puzzle that will create a picture of our state's future. Within these areas, we can make changes or we can continue things as they've been. The way we put the puzzle pieces together will have long-term effects on the Louisiana we know and love. We begin with safety. Food is my life. And the foods most associated with Louisiana come from a culture that's associated with the coastal areas of Louisiana in places just like this. They're endangered, they're fading fast. And you know what, if we lose this land and this water, we're not only gonna lose that, we're gonna lose the people and the raw ingredients that make up Louisiana's cultural gumbo. I'm concerned, you should be too. In the spring of 1927, after months of record rainfall across the Mississippi Valley, the swollen Mississippi River and its tributaries began to burst their banks. More than a million people were left homeless, most of them in Louisiana. So, to make sure the Mississippi River would never again pose such a threat, the federal government undertook one of the most ambitious engineering projects in American history. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built a massive levee system designed to protect citizens against future floods. However, as man attempted to outsmart Mother Nature, she had her own ideas, the effects of which we're seeing today. Dr. Denise Reed is a professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics at the University of New Orleans and an expert on coastal restoration. The coast of Louisiana was built by the Mississippi River over about the last five or six thousand years. Up until about a hundred years or so, the river used to migrate across the coast from one place to another. It would build land in one area and it would disappear in that area when the river went somewhere else. As a result of that, we get marshes in some areas, barrier islands in other areas, and the fingers of the river where the river used to go, those are the natural ridges, the natural bayou ridges of the coast where we live. For generations, these natural features protected us against the storms that battered the Louisiana coast year after year. But over the last century, these natural defenses have deteriorated. Our attempts to control the region's rivers have starved coastal areas of the sediments that used to sustain the delta. Our coastal marshes and wetlands are sinking and turning to open waters. This land loss is made worse by hurricane storm surges and rising sea levels. Dr. Robert Twilley directs Louisiana State University's Wetland Biogeochemistry Institute. Climate change is not only associated with sea level rise, but also the increased temperature of the oceans. We, we know that that is occurring. We are moving into a decade, most likely, of higher frequency of storms. So we are moving in a time period of greater vulnerability of our coastal communities. Other factors like man-made navigation channels, many of which were created for oil and gas exploration, have made matters worse. They allowed salt water to intrude on freshwater areas, killing the plants that hold the soil together. Along the coastline, Barrier islands, which serve as a first line of defense against hurricane storm surges, are also disappearing. Mark Davis is the director of the Institute on Water Resources Law and Policy at Tulane University. 
Barrier islands play a critical role in the loss of wetlands, not that they prevent all wetland loss, but they're like the cork in a bottle. They prevent the forces from, the go from coming in, scouring, and eroding the wetlands, and they also help prevent salt water from moving in to the fresher environments. The loss of these barrier islands may greatly accelerate the deterioration of our remaining wetlands. Hundreds of thousands of Louisianians have witnessed this incredible erosion in their lifetimes, and they understand that it affects every facet of life on the coast. Cheryl Segrera is a farmer in South Vermilion Parish. His family lost homes, cattle, crops, everything to Hurricane Rita storm surge. I attribute 99% of the, 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 the devastating effect Rita did here to the loss of coastal wetlands. Uh, we, we're losing so much wetlands. Years ago, we had some kind of buffer that protected us. Uh, I lived here 64 years. Never had a storm, get, never had water in our house. All of a sudden, we got water in our house. That's telling you that because we're losing 25 to 30 square miles a year, uh, it kind of rings a bell. It tells you that, hey, if you'd had that protection, you probably, not that you wouldn't have got any water here, but you wouldn't have had the devastating effect it made. Not only are our homes and property under threat, our unique culture and heritage valued throughout the world are in danger of disappearing. Grammy-nominated musician Irvin Mayfield understands what's at stake as much as anyone. How can we strengthen a culture of, that, that's indigenous to this city uh, that doesn't just thrive in halls, uh, it doesn't just hang on walls in museums, you can find it in the streets, you can find it in the backyard. Our communities and culture are more vulnerable because of this land loss, and so are our industries, our infrastructure, our livelihoods. Louisiana's coast is a working coast, vital to American commerce. Louisiana ports handle more than 25% of the nation's waterborne exports and more than 40% of U.S. grain exports. Coastal Louisiana is the nation's largest and most productive coastal ecosystem, supporting a multi-million dollar world-class recreational hunting and fishing industry. The state's commercial fisheries produce 25% of all the seafood in the lower 48 states. We are the nation's largest shrimp, oyster, and blue crab producer. The coast also provides wildlife habitats and flyways. Marine biologist Carrie St. Pei is the director of the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program. The waterfowl, the ducks and the geese that fly through uh, here every year uh, depend on our wetlands to uh, replenish their food supplies and to uh, build up fat reserves because they're going back. Uh, it's a critical uh, need uh, for the whole waterfowl population of the uh, central flyway in the United States. Perhaps most critical to the nation is Louisiana's oil and gas infrastructure. Ted Falgu is director of Port Fouchon, one of the nation's most significant energy ports. When you talk about uh, a quarter of the country's energy supply uh, dependent on coastal Louisiana. It's just not as simple as turning on your lights. It's a very complex thing that much of it de demands coastal Louisiana. In recent years, Louisiana's coastal land loss has left our vital assets more vulnerable than ever before. That loss had enormous consequences, enormous consequences for the ecosystem, and it really made cities like New Orleans, it made them exposed to open water in a way they had not been before. Open water right up against the city limits, and that, of course, causes enormous problems when storm surges come in. When we saw what Hurricane Katrina had done to the marshes, particularly in the area of Breton Sound to the east of New Orleans, we realized that just that one event could destroy large areas of marsh. The measurements say that we may have lost over 200 square miles of marsh during Katrina and Rita. In the aftermath of these two devastating storms, many of you have said your greatest concern is safety. What would happen if we continued on the course we're on, simply maintaining the investments we have underway?
Continuing the course that we've been pursuing over the last 20 years would mean maintaining levees in flood-prone areas and rebuilding them to pre-Katrina levels. It would continue the few small water and sediment diversion projects we currently have, but it would make no new investments to restore the coast. New Orleans and surrounding communities would receive protection from many storms, but not the most severe ones. Of course, continuing what we are doing would not require any new investments beyond what we already have planned. Right now, about $50 million a year is spent in Louisiana on coastal restoration, and Congress appropriated $5.7 billion to the Army Corps of Engineers to restore the levees around New Orleans. But if we continue what we're doing now, there would also be no increase in hurricane protection for New Orleans or most of the rest of Louisiana's coastline. Protective wetlands and barrier islands would continue to erode at their current rate, making us all more vulnerable to hurricanes. And coastal industries like oil and gas and seafood would become more and more endangered. A much more aggressive strategy is being offered by the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, or the CPRA. The state is proposing an ambitious plan to both restore Louisiana's protective wetlands and improve hurricane protection across the entire coast. The state's plan, currently in its preliminary draft phase, calls for multiple lines of defense against storm surges. It would increase levee protection around New Orleans and other large cities, and it would add new storm protection for smaller communities across the Louisiana coast. That should be reassuring to Juan Thibodeau, a 20-year resident of New Orleans East. His neighborhood took a severe hit from the storms of 2005. I mean, our levees should be well protected because we're, you know, humans. Um, we're, you know, Americans, and uh, I think, uh, you know, we all felt we was protected, you know, when we moved here. So uh, I'm thinking uh, they should should build, rebuild the levees to uh, withstand a Hurricane Katrina, or uh, maybe better. Uh, you know, there's there's thousands of people that that love the area, love their home. And they should have the right to come home and rebuild and, you know, and prosper. The state plan also emphasizes the need to rely on multiple lines of defense. That means more than just levees. It includes restoring wetlands, rebuilding barrier islands and protective ridges, and reinforcing shorelines. It calls for targeted river diversion projects that prevent wetland loss. It also plans to quickly create new marshes by piping in sediments. Finally, it calls for a large-scale diversion of the Mississippi River, somewhere in Lower Plaquemines Parish. Initially, this strategy would slow land loss, rebuild natural defenses, and increase protection from hurricanes. And over time, and we're talking potentially generations, we could see the regrowth of our wetlands. Larger-scale river diversions would affect some residents in Lower Plaquemines Parish who could lose their property. And although the science supports this type of action, there's no guarantee that it will work on such a large scale. Daniel Freeman has already lost a lot. Katrina drove water over the tops of both the river levee just north of his store and the marsh levee to the south. If the uh, river was turned loose north of Port Sulphur, well, that would... Uh... I guess mean the end of uh, life as we know it. Perhaps uh, river diversion would be the best possible option to help the coastal erosion situation, but if it involves writing off a whole area with all the people involved in their livelihoods and their homes and their lives, I think we're still in the state of Louisiana and still in the United States, and so um, we would hope that we just wouldn't be written off and would be protected like uh, other areas. A major river diversion could also change the salt content along southeastern Louisiana's coast. This would mean oyster beds would have to be moved, and we could see saltwater species of fish and shrimp shift toward the Gulf of Mexico in certain areas. But in the end, wetlands and marsh restoration would preserve freshwater habitat, which is currently in decline because of land loss. 
This strategy would also require further study to make sure navigation on the Mississippi could be maintained when the river is diverted. The state's plan would be quite costly. Estimates have yet to be calculated, but restoration and protection would probably cost tens of billions of dollars. The state's proposed plan is ambitious and comprehensive. It would address safety through a multiple lines of defense strategy. It would raise existing levees and add new ones. It would slow wetland loss. It would rebuild barrier islands, and it would reinforce shoreline. As you can see from the long list, this is a very complex issue. And in just a few minutes, we'll be asking you for your input. We'll also ask you what values in a protection and restoration plan are most important to you. Community preservation, commercial fishing, navigation and ports, recreational hunting and fishing, oil and gas infrastructure, and wildlife habitat and flyways. And finally, we will ask you how important you think funding and implementation of the state's proposed plan is to the recovery. I've been painting here for 40 years. I've painted Cajuns, oak trees, hurricanes, and I want to continue to do that. And I think this is the place for me to be because uh, I love it so much. And I hope the new economic development that we all are participating in will give us new ideas, a new vision, a new start, and for everyone to come back to Louisiana and see a new Louisiana. Creating economic opportunity depends on making the right choices. Later in this segment, we'll be looking at seven specific economic options. But first, some background. The 1970s were an oil boom time. Vast reserves were discovered in Louisiana's Tuscaloosa trend. There were plenty of jobs. Louisiana royalties and severance taxes on oil and gas totaled nearly $837 million. That's 42% of the state's revenue in 1982. Then seemingly, without warning, oil and gas prices plunged. The oil depression of the 1980s hit and Louisiana's fortunes changed. Even today, our state has an abundance of advantages. Major rivers, highways, and railroads intersect in Louisiana. We have valuable natural resources and a unique culture. Yet despite these strengths, we've fallen behind most of the nation in education and income. Many of our children are not given the training or education required to succeed. Meanwhile, well-educated Louisianians often have a hard time finding a job here that fits their skills, so they leave. In the wake of Katrina and Rita, we face continued uncertainty about our economy, but we also have the opportunity to redefine Louisiana's role in the nation and the world. Many observers believe that education will be key to an economic turnaround. Louisiana economist Tim Ryan is the University of New Orleans Chancellor. He says one of the biggest errors the state ever made was failing to invest in education and infrastructure a generation ago. When the oil boom occurred in the late 70s and early 80s, Texas created these trust funds, these constitutionally protected trust funds, and they put dollars into higher education and into infrastructure, ports and roads, and, and the kinds of in infrastructure that supports uh, commerce and supports business. We didn't. A healthy economy requires education and training, innovation and entrepreneurship, access to technology and financing, and a range of job options. Ultimately, a stronger economy simply means better pay and more opportunities for us and our children. As you can see, a long-range vision is necessary to create a more prosperous future. Our state and its business and education leaders are working to find the right combination of economic development and education initiatives to lead Louisiana out of the post-Katrina Rita economy. If we're going to continue to compete in the 21st century, we have to be strategic and focus on what works. But what is the right combination of ideas? Let's look at some of the critical areas affecting Louisiana's economic development. Louisiana is a global leader in some industries. These include energy production, 
chemicals, seafood, ports, shipping, timber, tourism, and cultural businesses. These all rely on our natural resources or our advantageous location. In the future, the state could continue to improve and expand these industries, especially in ways that use technology to add value to the goods and services we produce. Our training programs would produce a workforce with skills to meet these industries' needs. Emerging resource industries, such as biofuels, would be targeted for growth. Today, while the oil and gas industry remains an important part of the state's economy, it is critical that we not put all our eggs in one basket, according to Michael Olivier, head of Louisiana Economic Development. We need to consider ourselves, instead of an oil and gas state, we need to consider ourselves an important energy state, not only in oil and gas, but also in the future fuels, including nuclear, including wind, including other sources that Louisiana can be a player in because we have the infrastructure. In Louisiana, tourism is also considered a traditional industry and is one of the state's largest employers. Through his music, official New Orleans cultural ambassador Irvin Mayfield has been a key player in Louisiana's cultural economy. The culture of Louisiana is unmeasurable in benefit to the state. And the city of New Orleans, you should take what I just said, magnify that times one million, and perhaps we'll be somewhere close to it. Each of these industries have the needed infrastructure, workforce, and natural resources already here in Louisiana. To help turn emerging technologies into profitable ventures, Louisiana is recruiting high-tech firms and funding advanced university research and development. In Lafayette, Dr. Carolina Cruz heads up the Louisiana Immersive Technologies Enterprise, or LIGHT. Research teams there are developing interactive immersive environments, all powered by supercomputers. These tools enable even small Louisiana companies to use real-time remote visualization and computing. A lot of these companies don't have the financial power to have these advanced technologies in-house, but they do have the financial power to use them to come to our center and spend with us a morning, a week, a month, and actually access the technology. And in that way, our role, our relevance to the state is we help all this powerful industry of Louisiana to stay competitive with the rest of the nation and keep on track with the technology developments. Advanced technologies like light could be tied to existing expertise in areas such as coastal restoration, environmental mitigation, aquaculture, medical research, or digital media. These sectors typically pay high wages, but they also require highly skilled workers. The estimated job growth within much of the sector is high. South Louisiana is already home to the largest port complex in the nation. Our ports handle more than $75 billion in cargo each year. Improving trade by strategically investing in ports, rails, and highways could lead to increased imports and exports and more jobs. Salaries in the sector are generally good and labor demand is increasing. Gary LaGrange, Chief of Operations of the Port of New Orleans, knows the maritime industry and its workers well. They're not only making the Port of New Orleans happen, they're making some child on Christmas morning happy because his, because his iPod showed up under the Christmas tree, because it came in a container from Asia, from China, from Japan, or from some place, to the Port of New Orleans, through the Port of New Orleans, onto the shelves of the retail market. Recruiting and retaining large companies has been a successful strategy for many states. This is a competitive arena, so states use financial and tax incentives and a competitive business climate to attract and keep businesses. States target both durable goods manufacturers like automobile plants and knowledge-based companies like pharmaceutical labs. Nurturing homegrown businesses and small firms can build a healthy and dynamic economy. 
Increasing programs that provide technical assistance and access to capital can help grow entrepreneurs and small businesses. This can lead to broad economic growth and stability, according to Dr. Tim Ryan. We have to focus on the existing businesses and we have to focus on new and emerging startup businesses. That doesn't mean that economic development efforts shouldn't look at trying to attract businesses in from out of state. It's always a part of economic development. But that's not your bread and butter. Your bread and butter has to be growing your own, growing the existing businesses and creating new businesses. Prior to the storms, there were over 330,000 small businesses in Louisiana. Small businesses employ the majority of Louisiana workers and tend to keep profits in state. However, owning your own business in Louisiana can be tough. Our entrepreneur employment rates are low by national standards. Of the 50 states, Louisiana ranks 36th in terms of employed people who own their own businesses. But entrepreneurs like Comet Technologies President Spencer Hoyt are pioneering the new economy in our state. We specialize in internet marketing. We build websites in a way that are search engine friendly to propel a website in the search engines to drive more traffic and more visitors to your business. Training people for specific jobs, such as shipbuilder, computer technician, or nurse, can be an effective way of placing Louisiana workers in good paying jobs. This kind of training also helps Louisiana companies find the type of workers they need to stay competitive. Economist Tim Ryan believes that highly capable workers are essential to attracting business to the state. You can't produce a product without a qualified, trained workforce. And when businesses look at where they're going to locate, the first thing they look at is where can they find educated, skilled workers. Jason Phillips received specialized training that helped him land his position as lead control technologist at North Oaks Health System in Hammond. You have to go to a radiology school to do a job that I do. So um, without um, graduating from that um, school, you wouldn't be able to go into this field. So. Um, it has basically helped me to do the job that I wanted to do to help people. The presence of quality higher education institutions is often cited by businesses as being important to them deciding where to locate. Universities also contribute research and new products that create new business opportunities. And community colleges and universities prepare Louisianians for higher paying jobs in many industries. Former administrative assistant Carla Halpern wanted to expand her opportunities for advancement. She recently received her accounting degree from Nichols State. My education has enabled me to hire on as a staff accountant and without that degree you're pretty much limited to um, administrative assistant secretarial type positions. Louisiana's systems of four-year universities and two-year community colleges provide many options for students. Walter Bumpus, former president of the State Community and Technical College System, says such a mix is needed. It's projected that in the next 10 years, approximately 65 to 70 percent of the new jobs will require something more than a high school degree but less than a baccalaureate degree. By now, you probably realize how important our future economic development strategy is to our quality of life. And there's no clear-cut answer. So that's why we need your help. Remember, we want to hear what you think, so don't forget to weigh in. In a few minutes, we'll ask you to tell us which of these strategies and investments are your top priorities for economic development in Louisiana. Growing up in New Orleans was a fun time for me, especially as a youngster, uh, and having neighborhoods where you could uh, really walk to the nearest store. New Orleans was that kind of a city where uh, your neighbors knew your name. Your mom would leave you there and, and she would tell you, you better be good because Miss So-and-so is going to look after you and she tells, she's going to tell me what you did wrong. 
How and where our region grows can affect things like traffic patterns, housing cost, and revitalization of communities. Even our safety from storms depends on where we choose to live. Based on national population growth trends, by 2050, Louisiana could have 1.4 million more residents. Where will these people live? Where will they work? And how will they move around? As Louisiana recovers and rebuilds from the storms of 2005, we have the opportunity to determine the best way to handle current and future growth. Should we continue building the way we have been, or should we consider other alternatives? Now is the time to ask, how should we grow? Across the U.S. and Louisiana, communities have dramatically changed over the past several generations. Neighborhoods that were once closely knit, both socially and physically, have spread out and spread apart. The majority of the residents live in single-family homes at the outskirts of town. Most everyone relies on their car to get around. For residents, such as Lori Martinez, who moved from the city to the country, the increased commute time this created is offset by her desire for more space. I really don't mind my commute to work. Um, you don't have a lot of the conveniences of the city when you live in the country, but it is just so nice at the end of the day to make that drive home and, and get into the country where it's so quiet and it's peaceful and you have wildlife and just a lot more space than what you have in the city. But with commuting comes traffic congestion. Annually, households in South Louisiana average over 41 hours stuck in traffic, an entire work week. If current trends continue, by 2050, a family could spend over 174 hours in their car. That's more than four work weeks. Conventional wisdom has been to add lanes to combat congestion. Urban planner Steve Villavasso explains it doesn't always work that way. The traditional approach was we keep adding lanes of roadways to meet the demand of those roadways. But we have found out as planners that the more lanes you add, the more people you attract to an area. So we become a chicken and egg. We add two lanes and we end up with 5,000 extra units. Then we need two more lanes. Well, we've now come to the conclusion that we need to sync together our land use planning, our community planning, and our transportation planning and make them work together. Traffic analysts say that if the state continues its current growth patterns, by 2050, major roads in South Louisiana's five largest cities will be beyond capacity, gridlock. Traffic congestion is not the only effect of the way we're currently growing. By 2050, the state could see 460 square miles of open land converted to new development. Following existing trends, most new homes will be single-family homes, even though these don't always make the most sense for less affluent people or people like retirees or singles. And providing all those new utilities and roads to new subdivisions increases cost for taxpayers. Finally, if we keep going like we are now, much of that new development would be in floodplains. Current trends would place 445,000 more people in floodplains by 2050. Possible alternatives to our current development patterns begin by focusing more on building in existing cities and towns, living in more compact communities, and relying on a mix of public transportation and roads. We could make these changes in a moderate or more sweeping way. We could mix new approaches with our conventional growth patterns or head entirely in new directions. John Friganese is a principal at the regional planning firm Friganese Calthorpe Associates, a part of the Louisiana Speaks team. Mixed income, mixed use development is much more transportation efficient. The per capita use of cars and travel is much lower. But it also revitalizes town centers. It brings life to, to formerly dead places. It builds your tax base, and I think most importantly for the individual, it gives people a new choice, a place to live. A lot of cities around the U.S. have become very excited and very um, revitalized. John Rennie, with the University of New Orleans Urban Planning and Transportation Studies Program, says we can use the past as our guide for our future development. 
Back then, we lived in more tightly knit communities, connected by public transportation. New Orleans is a great example of this. If you compare the num if you look at the number of trips uh, that are made in New Orleans on public transportation and, and walking, a much higher percentage are made in New Orleans when you compare it to the suburban locations. In this approach, there would be more new construction in existing cities and towns. We would recycle old buildings and put up new ones that have a mix of shops and housing. Marion Johnson lives and works in downtown Baton Rouge. I love being able to take care of um, personal business downtown with the convenience of being able to go to the banks, to go shopping. I love it living in a walkable community. Many people prefer living in the suburbs, but by focusing development in existing cities and towns, Louisiana households could save up to 30% in annual expenses. Living in town saves people on fuel cost. It also saves on taxes and bills because we need fewer new roads and utilities. Building more in town also means fewer people will be building in unprotected floodplains outside of town. But the traditional model of the French Quarter or other older Louisiana neighborhoods does present challenges. This type of development requires major changes in building regulations to allow mixing houses and shops together. More high-density, multifamily housing means fewer options for people who want single-family homes. The cost of building in town is higher, and that can make development there expensive. Also, the cost of building public transportation systems is extremely high. And finally, despite its historical roots, in-town living is new to many in Louisiana, and there's no way to know if it would catch on here like it has in other places in the United States. We have a choice of whether or not to encourage this kind of change. We also can choose how much change to encourage. We could change a little or change a lot. How we grow and what the new Louisiana will look like are questions you can answer. In a few minutes, we'll ask you to make a choice on that. If you owned property in Louisiana back in the 18th century, one of the first things you learned was that you had to deal with flooding, especially on the best land along the Mississippi River. However, early settlers learned to adapt. You either lived close to town on high ground where a small amount of levees protected you, or if you lived farther out, you built your house on the highest ground you could find and then raised it and you farmed on the parts of the property prone to flooding. Traditionally, we built on higher ground because floods happen. Dr. Claudette Reichel is a housing specialist with LSU. However, as development occurred, people like to live near the coast, and so there's a market demand for that. It's a demand that comes with a price, according to environmental expert Mark Davis. One of the effects that wetland development can have on flooding and, and the risk to human life and you know, communities down here could be seen from Hurricane Katrina. Many of the areas that flooded worst were the areas that had been built into wetlands over the last two generations. They were wet before and they were wet again. Today, with our modern subdivisions, shopping malls and office parks, Louisiana's development is very similar to any other part of the United States, even though we are much more at risk for natural disasters like flooding and hurricanes. Now since Katrina and Rita, we all need to take a fresh look at where we, we should and shouldn't build and how we should build. In, in Louisiana, our coastal areas are not just resorts for second homes for rich folks. They are vital, vital parts of the economy for our state as well as for the nation. Coastal areas need workers. Workers need to live there. So we do need to um, have strategic land use planning, but not make the mistake of having a blanket, no one should ever live or build near the coast because that's where oil and gas is, that's where our seafood industry is. And many in, of the people in Louisiana who live there work there, that is their livelihood. So they need a safer, smarter, stronger way to live and, and to build homes there. The devastation of Katrina and Rita 
was the result of natural and human causes. Powerful storms and unexpected levee failures compromised our safety. But the stage was set by decades of decisions about how to protect ourselves and how our communities grow. Sally Campbell and her family thought they knew the risk involved in living near the coast. We were, we were fairly comfortable that we might get some water. We thought maybe two feet. Never dreamed of the tidal surge that we were going to get, the direct hit that we got here in Slidell. Although their hearts are with their former Slidell neighbors, the Campbells won't be coming back. In Louisiana, we value the ability of a property owner to use their land as they choose. Our Constitution gives a great deal of freedom to property owners. There are few limits to where people can build. Property rights and individual freedoms are important values to us. But when people build in areas with high risk of storm and flood damage, they pass that risk on to everyone. We are all in the same insurance pools, so all our rates rise to cover added risks. And we all pay taxes, which pay for disaster recovery and other costs. We know where the unprotected high-risk areas are, but people own that land and they can build on it. So the basic question is, how should we balance individual rights with community risk? How exactly do we make Louisiana safer and reduce damage and loss from storms to the benefit of all property owners? Options range from requiring more state-level investment to even restricting the use of land development in floodplains or areas designated as high risk. Some believe we should allow individuals to build wherever they want as long as they're prepared for the consequences. For Kevin Belanger, the dangers of living in harm's way are outweighed by the rewards of life in the wetlands of Terrebonne Parish. We have excellent fishing and uh, just the life down here is very peaceful and uh, it, it, it's easy. Uh, we, we wanted to stay and, and no matter what, we, what it was going to cost, we were going to try to make and scrape and make sure we were able to do it. What he was able to do was raise his house over 10 feet above the street level. 16 feet higher than the nearby levee. I believe that the majority of the population is really, really reliant upon levee systems. And, and I can tell you that I have not taken that approach. I'm, on, I'm gonna try to do what I can to make my own improvements to make sure that we're not impacted by another hurricane. We need to be able to provide uh, that level of safety or you're gonna go crazy thinking every day you come home that your home may not be there uh, from a storm. Our safety depends on where and how we build new homes, locate our jobs, and develop transportation routes. We can reduce community risk by limiting development in floodplains and giving homeowners and businesses less discretion to locate wherever they choose. But what is the right balance of individual freedom and community risk? These are tough choices and trade-offs. That's why we need your input. There are several different ways to limit community risks that affect us all. Building codes that require additional structural strengthening, requirements to elevate buildings, and land use restrictions in unprotected flood-prone areas. People might also face consequences for choosing to build in high-risk areas. Some of these could include less access to private, state, or federal insurance, less access to services or utilities, or less access to disaster recovery funds. Recognizing these trade-offs, let's consider our choices. There are three basic options about how and where we build as we recover and grow, each with different impacts. The first option would emphasize individual property rights. That would mean people would face no increased restriction on where or how they build. However, this could continue the current trend of building in unprotected, flood-prone areas, which in turn could lead to increases in insurance rates for all Louisiana homeowners. The cost of rescue and recovery would also be borne by all citizens. The second would create new rules for living in high-risk areas. These regulations and restrictions 
like the ones we just discussed, could require people in unprotected flood-prone areas to prepare for the consequences. It could also reduce their access to insurance or disaster relief. Such policies might also lead to fewer people living in unprotected flood-prone areas, which would further reduce community risk. This means people would be somewhat restricted on where they build and live. The third option would prohibit development in unprotected flood-prone areas. Few people would live in high-risk areas. That would result in reduced loss from flooding and storms, lowering overall insurance rates. However, there would be stringent restrictions limiting new development. This means people would not be free to build wherever they choose. Finding the right mix of individual rights and community responsibility is a challenge. In a few minutes, we'll ask you for your ideas on finding the right mix. South Louisiana is more than just a collection of towns and cities. We are all connected, and our futures are intertwined through our wetlands, highways, and regional economies. Through this regional planning initiative, we are working to help create plans for future growth that balance our region's history, natural environment, and economy, while also preserving our culture and the good things that make us who we are. Now that we've looked at some of the decisions facing Louisiana, it's time for you to create a plan for the future. This is the response sheet we'll be using, as well as the newspaper insert with information about your choices. The poll is also online at www.louisianaspeaks.org, or you may call 1-888-PLAN-2050 or 1-888-752-6205. We have talked in this program about creating more opportunities for everyone in Louisiana. But as we look to a future post-hurricanes, what should be our focus? We ask you to select three priorities from a list of seven strategies designed to create more and better jobs. A. Pursue new opportunities in traditional industry sectors. B. Foster knowledge-based businesses. C expand trade and shipping. D, attract and retain companies. E, nurture entrepreneurs and small companies. F, expand job skills and vocational training. G, strengthen colleges and universities. Remember, we ask you to choose just three options from this list of seven possibilities. Our second question involves making us safer from storms. This was the number one concern of our fellow citizens. We need your input on what values our coastal protection and restoration plan should preserve. Choose three of the following six. A, community preservation. B, commercial fishing. C, navigation and ports. D, recreational hunting and fishing. E oil and gas infrastructure. F, wildlife habitat and flyways. Remember, we want you to choose three of these six options. Question number three asks you to indicate how important you think funding and implementation of the new proposed state plan for coastal protection and restoration is to recovery. Choices range from very important to not at all important please choose one. Finally, we look at how Louisiana should grow. This is where the path we choose will take us to very different destinations. What will Louisiana look like in the year 2050? We've talked about building safer homes and communities, about quality of life, individual rights, and yes, traffic. Now we're bringing it all together. Question number four, Ask, how should we grow? A, keep building and developing as we are. B, modify development patterns or C, focus development on existing cities and towns. Please choose one. Question number five is our last issue, but it is an especially difficult one for Louisiana where there have been few limits on where people can build and live. 
What do you think is the right mix of property rights and community risk? We ask you to mark one of these choices. A. Emphasize property rights. B. Balance property rights and community risk. Or C. Emphasize reducing community risk. Well, that's a wrap for this program, but it's just the beginning for a new future for Louisiana. Wherever you are living now, we ask you to be a part of planning that future. You have until February 10th to be a part of this historic moment in time. When you are asked, what did you do following the largest natural disaster in this country's history? What will be your answer? The choices we make today will shape Louisiana for generations. We hope you'll choose to be a part of Louisiana Speaks. History tells us that when people lead, the leaders will follow. So help us chart a new course, a new direction for our state. Use your voice. Speak up, Louisiana. To give more feedback on any aspect of the Louisiana Speaks regional vision, log on to www.louisianaspeaks.org or write Louisiana Speaks, 721 Government Street, Suite 103230, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70802. Teachers, your students can become part of the Louisiana Speaks planning process. Find out how your students can create and share their own visions for Louisiana's future. Click on Louisiana Public Square at www.lpb.org. Funding for this program made possible in part by a grant from the Fannie Mae Foundation, helping to rebuild Louisiana.